I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears in which we take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms host conversations with the people capturing the imagination of Australians right now. This week we talk with award-winning writer Paddy Manning, author of The Successor, The High Stakes Life of Lachlan Murdoch. Manning is no stranger to big books about powerful people, having previously penned biographies of former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and former mining billionaire Nathan Tinkler. He's also working on a PhD, a century of news corporation, and is appearing soon at both the Sydney and Byron Writers' Festivals. And hosting this conversation, about everything from Rupert to Lachlan, Crikey to Dominion, Tucker and Trump, and Succession for the Murdoch Empire, plus Succession, the TV show, is the editor of Good Weekend, Katrina Strickland. Welcome, Paddy. Hi, Katrina. Thank you for having me. So tell us what's happened overnight. There's been a bit of news. We're, we're recording this on Wednesday. There's been a bit of news with um, Tucker Carlson and Fox. Tell us what's happened. Well, it's this amazing story continues to unfold. Tucker Carlson was the most popular host on their controversial primetime opinion program at um, Tucker Carlson tonight, 8 o'clock, and was a kingmaker in the Republican Party and extraordinarily powerful. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Say what you will about elected Democrats, but they know where the power is. They're like truffle pigs for power. (laughs) No matter how thick the and is, for Lachlan Murdoch and Rupert and Fox News Chief uh, Suzanne Scott to fire Tucker Carlson is the biggest possible signal of you know uh, the, a new era at Fox News. Now, what's happened overnight? And that sorry, when did the sacking happen? It was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago in the immediate, like days after Fox had agreed to pay seven hundred and eighty seven and point five million dollars US to Dominion, the voting machine manufacturer, to um, settle their defamation claim. Moments ago, we learned there is a settlement, a settlement in the high stakes trial between Dominion voting systems and Fox. Dominion was suing Fox for $1.6 billion. And so it's everyone's been unclear what Tucker's going to do. He's posted one kind of video that was a bit like a proof of life video uh, just in the immediate aftermath of him being sacked where he kind of just talked about the fact that he, you know, was not going away. Uh, short little two-minute video in, on Twitter. Uh, it got... 26 million views, I think. And now he's announced overnight that, in fact, he's going to be doing a show much like his old um, Tucker Carlson tonight, but it'll be Tucker Carlson completely unfiltered on Twitter. The best you can hope for in the news business at this point is the freedom to tell the fullest truth that you can. But there are always limits. And you know that if you bump up against those limits often enough, you will be fired for it. That's not a guess. Uh, Which is interesting because he's had so many offers, you know, from cable networks on the right of Fox like Newsmax and OAN to come and join them. He's had a lot of options, but he's decided to go completely independent on Twitter. And who's paying him? Is Elon Musk paying him? We don't. Apparently not. Elon has tweeted that there was no deal with Tucker. So, uh, so, but Tucker has described Twitter as the last platform for free speech in the world, and he's also it's been reported overnight uh, now in legal negotiations with Fox News, which obviously has a you know tight. I mean, they were paying him twenty million dollars a year, reportedly, and while we don't know the terms of it, it's presumed that there's a very tight non-compete that contract extended out until 2025 is my understanding. So there was the prospect that Tucker might be silenced all the way through the 2024 presidential campaign, which of course uh, he couldn't stand and nor could his followers. And so now he's gone straight onto Twitter with another three-minute video denouncing the media, all of them, uh, as being um, Specifically liars. Specifically Fox or not? No, he doesn't denounce Fox. He is now in the middle of a negotiation, which is obviously a tense negotiation, uh, with Fox News about the terms of his separation. And according to the reports that I've just seen overnight, he's prepared to leave money on the table so long as he's got the freedom to do his own show. And, uh, and would one of the arguments be that doing it on Twitter is not whatever the non-compete? Potentially. You know? 
Yes, so maybe the provisions of the non-compete would be, you know, more restrictive if he had tried to go to another rival cable network, for example, uh, than if he just goes and produces a show straight on Twitter. Uh, And, yeah, so apparently, according to the New York Times, he did have a conversation with Lachlan Murdoch as Fox Corp CEO on Monday, uh, and, yeah, negotiations between them broke down. So at the moment it's not looking like an amicable separation, but he hasn't defected to a competitor. Instead he's going to go completely independent and do his own digital thing, which is a path that actually other Fox News hosts have have followed in the past. But uh, how do they monetize success. that? Yeah, how do they monetize it? Because if Twitter's free, you can't get ads on your own Twitter feed, I assume. How do you make money from it? Yes, it's not clear. Uh, so uh, so we'll have to see and what kind mm. of audience will he get. But you have to assume there will be a way if his reach is what, you know, that 26 or maybe 24 million viewers yeah. who hit his first video, if his reach is that, is that large, uh, there's got to be a way. There's, yeah, you know, that's the money follows audience. the eyeballs, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But and it is going to be a fascinating test case then, isn't it, of – the power of, I guess, we would call it the masthead, but the brand, Fox, versus the power of the individual. You know, historically in the media, it would be fair to say the individual often thinks they're bigger than the brand, but they really are. The, basically, the brand normally survives and the individual has to find another brand. But do you think that the media times are different now? And the- uh, Well, I, I definitely think it could work um, for someone that popular. Uh, you know, he has such a rusted on base uh, and there's no one else really in the Fox News lineup that looks like they can easily occupy his, you know, prime 8pm slot. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida joins us now to explain. Governor, thanks so much for coming on. So you're activating the National Guard. What will they do? So they've been uh, heavy in this ever since we activated Tucker over the last week to 10 days. They've been trialling Kelly McInerney, uh, the former White House um, spokesperson uh, under Trump. But yeah, the ratings at the moment, in his 8pm slot, they're coming last as of last week. Uh, so, so they've dropped from clearly um, head and shoulders above the other cable networks to last in the space of a fortnight without Tucker. Um, I think that, you know, previous, um, you know, celebrated uh, Fox News uh, commentators who've who've gone independent, like Bill O'Reilly, whether, you know, he was dismissed over sexual harassment claims or Megyn Kelly who chose to leave, and they've gone off and done their own things digitally and they've kind of never got the same clout that mm. they had with Fox. And Fox News now is kind of gambling uh, that history re- will repeat and Tucker will do likewise and, you know, uh, and they will manufacture someone new to take that to take that audience, win that audience back. I wrote in my biography um, of Lachlan Murdoch that it was an iron law of the Murdoch empire that um, no one was indispensable, and I and I believe that's true. But this is the biggest test that the Murdochs have faced, uh, given you know, given Tucker's popularity and the kind of the kind of toxic kind of polarization that is happening not just in American politics but in the American media. Yeah, I, I think it's it's kind of all adding up to a sense of a real crossroads uh, for Lachlan Murdoch right now. I mean, he's been in the chair there as CEO and executive chairman of Fox since they um, sold the rest of the business to Disney back in 2018-19. Uh, and, and this is the biggest test that he's faced, I think. And tell us how, I guess, how significant the Dominion decision was and then the flow on really with the crikey he was suing crikey over an op-ed piece that they ran that he's now discontinued that case what do those two decisions on those big legal cases say do you think well i suppose i should just back up a little bit and explain where what where the dominion and crikey lawsuits came from if you cast your mind back to the 2020 the night of the 2020 election Fox News was the first network to call Arizona, which was a swing state, a purple state, uh, for Biden. Early on the uh, night of the 2020 election, by calling Arizona for Biden, Fox News was effectively calling the election for Biden uh, because if Trump had lost Arizona, he could not make the 270 um, electoral college votes that he needed. When 
Fox News called Arizona, the Trump campaign went ballistic, and we know that now. That's come out um, in subsequent evidence and and other books as well. That Jared Kushner was calling Rupert Murdoch, and uh, you know the decision desk were calling up through to Lachlan Murdoch as CEO, and um, there were certainly conversations happening about whether that call should be retracted. What happened is the Trump base defected. They abandoned Fox News. They blamed Fox News effectively for the election result. And in the days after the 2020 election, Fox News ratings tanked and the MAGA base uh, took off to Newsmax and One American News Network. And Fox News had a real crisis at that point. They pressed the panic button, according to one of their own one of their own people. What they started to do was to countenance the kind of stolen election claims that the Trump campaign was making uh, and give airtime to them. And now they, they say that was because the, the claims were intrinsically newsworthy. Here is the um, president, still the sitting president of the United States, claiming that the election had been stolen. And Fox continues to believe that it was the right thing to do to report that. But in the process... Um, some of the people that they had on air, including uh, Rudy Giuliani, Trump advisor, and Sidney Powell, went on to programs like Ma- Maria Bartiromo's program on Fox Business and said that Dominion, which was a voting machine manufacturer, uh, had been part of a conspiracy to steal votes from Republicans and give them to Biden. And they, um, that Dominion was completely sued. baseless. And Dominion sued. Dominion wrote to Fox um, on multiple occasions saying, "This is you have no basis, you must correct this, you have no basis, you got it. But they continued to put those claims to air dozens and dozens of times. And Dominion sued in the end for defamation. Now, that was in, tw- in early 2021. It's taken two years for the uh, case to get to a point where it, it was settled right on the very first day when it was due to be a tr- six-week trial was due to commence in Delaware. And in the process, Dominion doggedly has sought discovery of all kinds of internal communications at Fox News which might support its case. And we have seen uh, in mid-February a release of hundreds of pages, uh, thousands of documents uh, with the uh, private communications of everyone from Rupert and Lachlan Murdoch down including Tucker Carlson, his texts, their emails uh, between themselves and producers, between themselves and their and their other colleagues on air, like Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram. And, and all of that evidence has proved to be a kind of bombshell. No exaggeration. What it showed was that nobody really inside Fox News, uh, certainly not the Murdochs, nobody really believed that the election had been stolen. And yet people were on air saying that. And yet people were on air saying that. Fox hosts privately acknowledged the vote rigging claims were false, but allowed them to be aired anyway. Today's settlement represents vindication and accountability. Lies have consequences. In February, a stunning trove of... So then they, he, they settled with Dominion... And then in the wake of that, presumably because of the information that came out there, Lachlan decided, do you think that it's just like, let's just get rid of these legal dramas and stop the crikey case? Yeah, so as I understand it, Lachlan's decision to drop his case against Crikey. Crikey had written at a piece during at the time of the January 6th congressional hearings in the United States into the um, insurrection uh, back in 2021. Um, when those hearings were underway, uh, Crikey's political editor, Bernard Keener, had written a piece in which he uh, described the Murdochs and their slew of poisonous Fox News commentators as, quote, unquote, unindicted co-conspirators with Donald Trump in the insurrection. Now, Lachlan sued personally in Australia. Australian media law is completely separate, of course, and different, very different to American media law where they have a First Amendment that protects free speech and the freedom of the press. Uh, we don't have anything like that here. What could be one of the media fights of the century, starring a small Australian website in the role of David and a huge multinational media corporation in the role of Goliath. No Lachlan's case was progressing through pre-trial hearings and was set down for October. 
because he had he was suing not just Bernard Keenan, the editor, um, former editor of Crikey Peter Frey, but then also was suing private media itself and the chief executive and chairman, uh, Will Hayward and Eric Beecher, because he was alleging that Crikey had originally published that piece then pulled it down because he demanded a retraction and apology, then they refused to apologise, then they republished it and put an advertisement uh, into the media in, Aust- in Australia and also into the New York Times effectively daring Lachlan Murdoch to sue. Peter Frey gave a comment to Porter at the Sydney Morning Herald saying, we're sick of being bullied by Lachlan Murdoch, and they saw it as a free speech issue and they republished their article. Lachlan's case uh, argued in part, first of all, he denied that he had conspired with Donald Trump and, uh, and engaged in any criminal conspiracy. Crikey conceded, in fact, in its correspondence with Lachlan that had no evidence that he'd done that. Their their defence was uh, that the ordinary reader reading Bernard's piece on that day would not have come to the conclusion that he literally meant that Lachlan Murdoch, for example, was conspiring criminally with um, Donald Trump. Mm. Now, that remained to be tested in, in a court of law, uh, but Lachlan's argument uh, in part was that Crikey had... Uh, kind of maliciously tried to use his dispute, use their dispute with Lachlan to raise money for subscriptions. And it's true that they did have a fighting fund that raised more than $600,000, I think, from supporters. But so why do you think Lachlan pulled out at this point in the wake of Dominion? Well, it made no sense for him. That, That case was set down for a trial in October, but Crikey was seeking to add some of the bombshell evidence that had been revealed during the Dominion case um, of the Murdoch's knowledge that the claims of the stolen election were baseless. They were trying to add that to the Australian proceedings. Uh, That would have set the trial back further, perhaps into 2024. and, And from Lachlan's point of view, as I understand it, it made no sense to be settling, paying such a huge check. I mean, it's the biggest defamation payout in history, as far as I know. In America. In America, apart from Alex Jones over the, by the Sandy Hook parents. Uh, but I think that's being appealed and maybe revised. So, But this is certainly an enormous check for uh, Fox to be writing. And it made no sense to be writing that check uh, while continuing to litigate the same issues in Australia um, for the next 18 to 24 months. And so so his decision was to walk away. And I know there's other cases coming from other um, yeah. election um, um, well, there's, counting manufacturers, right, machine well, the, manufacturers. Well, there's one, which there's is an one. even bigger claim by, by Smartmatic, another voting machine manufacturer who is alleging defamation on very similar grounds, in fact, to Dominion. So, no, there's a lot of commentary suggesting that they, that they expect it will be settled. It's a $2.7 billion claim, whereas Dominion was only claiming one point. So on its face, it's a scarier number. Uh, and got less than half of that. They got less than half, um, but it was still, a, you know, it's still amount. a large, a, yeah. a, a large sum. The trial is not. I mean, Lachlan said overnight again, um, not expected to be held until 2025. Um, so there's no urgency to settle on Fox on Fox's part. Just to wrap all that together, mm. what is the crossroads that Lachlan is at now? What, what, what are the, what do you think the big kind of things are for him at this point? Well, Fox is kind of at the moment holding up reasonably well, although its shares are off 10% since February when the Dominion evidence first came out. Lachlan's got so many balls in the air at the moment. Um, the Dominion... The, the whole big lie and the coverage of the big lie, Dominion and Smartmatic are sort of related cases um, and uh, because, you know, because there are obviously um, – there, there are also other claims coming. Um, there are um, – Abby Grossberg, a former producer, in fact, for Tucker Carlson, uh, is suing over um, – what she alleges was a kind of toxic, um, chauvinistic workplace. Um, she's suing Fox News um, 
Fox is saying that the claims are without merit, but that's another case. That's another kind of thorn you know, in your side. She has got a lot of tapes uh, that she actually made while she was a producer on the Tucker Carlson program. Uh, they're not just damaging to Tucker; some of them are damaging to the network as well. Uh, so she's got some evidence, and she's doing you know media appearances, and that's kind of un- that's messy. Uh, there are shareholder um, class actions that are looming, uh, as many as eight, against Fox for um, and the Fox directors, including Lachlan and Rupert, but also the other the rest of the board for putting uh, the, you know, baseless stolen election claims to air, which have resulted in this so far $800 million US settlement uh, and perhaps more to come. Um, so they're alleging negligence on behalf of directors, a failure to fulfil their duties. So that's one crossroads. Because, but, but the bigger thing is the, the original crisis in the wake of the 2020 election was the potential for Fox to lose its audience to competitors on the right. And now, fast forward two and a bit years, and here we are, we've got the same potential problem, a defection of the audience, for example, that's loyal to Tucker Carlson, uh, or a, dimin- a diminished credibility of the of the uh, Fox News in the eyes of uh, Trump's followers. And, you know, Rupert Murdoch himself was, was early to make um, clear that it was time, in his view for the Republican Party to move on from Trump. In the wake of the 2022 midterms um, in the US, the New York Post came out and described Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as, on the on its front page, the future. You know, because they, they are, Fox and the Murdochs, it seems, are trying to move on from Trump. And, and they're in this kind of arm wrestle with Trump, if you like. Uh, it's, it's interesting, one of... Um, Roger Ailes, you know, the Fox News founder um, and television um, genius by all accounts, evil genius perhaps, but um, but a, a, a television genius, warned um, Rupert Murdoch in 2016 that he had to be careful with Trump or he would take over the Fox audience. And I think we can see now exactly how, exactly what how Ailes meant. How that was. Yeah, yeah. Because, because Fox is... And all of the evidence that came out in the Dominion case shows that Fox is is scared of losing its audience. You know, you've got to bear in mind when Fox News was founded by Murdoch and Ailes back in 1996, there was no competitor on the right. Their, their idea was that they were competing with CNN, which Roger Ailes called the Clinton News Network, mm-hmm. uh, and that they were providing an alternative on the right to a, an otherwise small L liberal skewed media mm-hmm. uh, landscape. But now, fast forward 25 years, and Fox has got copycats on the right, like Newsmax and OAN, uh, and it is it is terrified of losing their audience up to those new competitors. So the no. existential question really is, do we go further to the right to keep that audience or do we stay where we are to try and keep that audience without Tucker or do we move more to the centre and get a different audience? Yes, that's right. So overnight, Lachlan at the, um, at the Fox earnings call was asked uh, about the departure of Tucker and asked about the Dominion settlement. This is the first opportunity for investors to really put questions to him. Mm. Uh, And he said there was not going to be a change of strategy at Fox News, that it's clearly been a successful strategy uh, and they're going to stick to it. They do believe in the strength of the Fox brand. They do believe that over 25 years they've shown that the Marset, if you like, uh, is more powerful than any particular individual. And so that's the big gamble that they've taken right now. But, uh, you know, at the same time... Yeah, that Trump, audience is not happy with them. That audience is not happy. And if they are not going to, for example, countenance election denial anymore, if they want to move on from the 2020 election, and yet Trump is still the leading candidate despite all his legal travails, including the verdict we've just had that he was, you know, guilty of, um, you know, sexual abuse of um, Jean Carroll, you know... In a civil court. In a civil court. Um, not a criminal court. And, and, has, and has got to pay $5 million in damages to her. And that's only one of the legal challenges that Trump faces. But nonetheless, he remains the leading front runner amongst the Republican candidates for the nomination uh, in 2024. And so how is Fox News going to manage, you know, if they're trying to step back from election denial, but Trump or 
other candidates for election in 2024, like Curry Lake, for example, are all still um, absolutely describing the 2020 election as the stolen election. How, how are they going to manage it? So it's a very difficult juncture. On top of that, you've got Lachlan's strategies around sports betting kind of in flux. You've got a merger that was proposed between Fox and News Corporation shelved because a sale collapsed of the US digital real estate business, which was supposedly going to garner for News Corporation $3 billion US, according to reports. That has collapsed. In Australia, you've got a situation where the future of Foxtel is not quite clear. You've also got, you know, Rupert, Lachlan's father, he's extremely protective of him. He's just been through a messy affair with Anne Leslie Smith that almost, you know, there was an engagement, then it was off. There is a lot uh, going on. <laughs> going on. Yeah, I think it's a really big test for Lachlan. And do you feel that he is increasingly taking over from Rupert? There's been some reports about Rupert stepping back a lot more, but Rupert's personality is not really to do that. What's your sense of that, you know, that succession? These choppy waters, um, you know, if they're able to navigate their way through those, I, I think r- my understanding is that Rupert and Lachlan Murdoch uh, still believe that the that the merger of Fox and News Corporation is a good idea. Um, you know, we never even saw a documented proposal about what a what a Fox and News Corp um, merger would look like. But I, I still believe, and I'm, you know, I'm not alone in this. There are uh, you know, plenty of analysts who who would say the same thing that 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 merger could well re you know, be put brought back onto the agenda, and then um, would Lachlan be at the top? Well, I think that is part of the that is part of the logic of the merger is that is that it would entrench Lachlan as CEO and executive chairman across the whole group. The whole group, you know, Lachlan has been the designated successor for at least the last six years, and yet it's a slow process. You know, uh, he's not about to try and kick his dad out of the company that he built, uh, and Rupert is not the retiring type, as we all know. So, I think the merger would would most likely see, um, I imagine, uh, but I'm speculating, most likely see uh, Rupert relinquish his last executive position. Um, inside the empire. I'm sure that he would remain a non-executive co-chairman with Lachlan, but he would no longer, there'd be no reason for him to retain that executive chairman role that he has, for example, at News Corporation. So that's my kind of tip. And so you've, your book, which you've mentioned a couple of times called The Successor, is all about Lachlan that was released last year. So you've done a real, not only a deep dive into news, but into Lachlan per se, what's your sense of why he has emerged among the kids as how much of that is to do with his inherent, I guess, leadership um, qualities and how much to do with being the oldest son or, um, you know, other other things? Like if you could encapsulate that, what what do you think has, has been behind him really emerging as the first amongst equals? Well, it's funny you say first amongst equals because that's what, that's the way Luke, Rupert described um, Lachlan mm. back in the, the mid late nineties uh, in an interview with the Financial Times. I think it was nineteen ninety seven. He said that Lachlan um, was probably the first amongst equals. Be and or the assumption by most uh, people at the time was that was because he was the eldest son, mm. and so James, you know, two years younger, uh, Elizabeth a little bit older, but yeah, Lachlan uh, at that point. Um, in the 90s was, you know, working here in Australia um, and and probably had the most senior position of the three siblings uh, who have taken an interest um, in the business. Uh, Lise quits. She uh, she quits after, um, you know, butting heads with um, Sam Chisholm uh, at B-Sky B in the UK and goes off to do her own thing, sets up Shine, later sells it back to News Corp um, for a profit, but she has never again worked inside the company she 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 quit and said she felt it was easier um to be a murdoch outside news corporation you know he has made money here in his own right uh the reason that he gets drawn back into the empire in through you know 2014 15 
uh, more than any other thing is probably that he was the last man standing, really, because, um, well, James well, James had been fairly or unfairly tarnished through the entire phone hacking scandal that broke in the UK. Unfairly because James had nothing to do with the phone hacking. He wasn't responsible for the British newspapers when the hacking occurred. Fairly because he was responsible for the um, response to the phone hacking um, scandal and, yeah, question mark whether he'd, he'd managed that well. Um, and certainly the perception was that he was tarnished and in that and in that and uh, and I think at that point um, Lachlan shapes um, in Rupert's eyes as the most reliable um, kind of steady hand and potential successor to the whole empire and then it takes a couple of years actually for Rupert to persuade Lachlan uh, to come he doesn't want to move his family back to the United States um, uh, and so there's a slow process of kind of uh, lure him, luring him back into a, an executive role um, at News and Fox as they became after the phone hacking crisis when they split up. So, uh, so yeah, it was a slow process before for um, Lachlan to emerge as the as the kind of designated successor, and it could all come undone again, of course, once Rupert passes, because um, the structure of the Murdoch Family Trust, which was you know arrived at as as a result of the divorce of um, Rupert and Anna Murdoch uh, the stru- and can't be changed the, the the structure is is that there are eight votes Rupert has four um, and the kids the four oldest kids have one each when Rupert dies uh, at the moment Rupert plus Lachlan equals five votes say even if the other three all agreed um they could yeah, be overridden yeah but but when rupert dies uh, and those votes expire it's amongst the four. four it's lachlan is only one vote amongst four and he could easily lose control at that point I and mean, the biggest story that came out of my book was a you know a few paragraphs which kind of strongly indicated that the um that the siblings were biding their time uh and that as one analyst um, told me off the record, you know, the day Rupert dies is the day Lachlan gets fired. Whereas the siblings had at one point, according to New York Times reporting, been prepared to sell out uh, of the empire, to sell out to Rupert and Lachlan and because they're not fans, uh, by and large, the siblings are not fans of Fox News and its direction and its impact on American politics. Um, what I reported was that um, the children, in fact, intended fully uh, to assert their rights, assert control. They were no longer interested in selling. They did intend to assert um, control of the Murdoch Family Trust and therefore of the whole empire and do it in a way that, quote-unquote, protects and enhances democracies around the world rather than undermines they them. Could, they could force it back to the centre They could once Rupert's no longer here. They could. And just finally, if we just go back to how you are such, you've emerged as such a kind of expert in matters Murdoch. Um, I sat next to you at the Financial Review, I think about 15 years ago. You worked at the Australian in the past, you worked at the Herald, Sydney Morning Herald. Then you went freelance in the early 2000s, I think 2012, 13. You were a property editor when I knew you. What made you decide? that this was going to be your area of specialty. I believe you're doing a PhD in the Murdochs at Macquarie Uni. Tell us briefly what what kind of drew you to this. Well, you know, the way I see it is the Murdoch Empire is probably the most powerful entity in this country uh, and – and somebody had to somebody had to do Lachlan's story. It wasn't my idea to do Lachlan's story, but Lachlan is clearly, although there's been 50 books about Rupert, there hadn't been a book about Lachlan. Um, I credit my um, publisher, Maurice Schwartz, who's the, who owns Schwartz Media and, the, and Black, um, Black Ink that did the biography. It was his idea to do a book on Lachlan. I was a little bit nervous at first. I can't say I wasn't daunted. I knew Lachlan was litigious, unlike... Rupert has never sued a journalist, but I was sitting on the business desk as chief of staff at the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age when uh, he did threaten to sue one of our um, reporters who had erroneously, as it turned out, accused him of flying in the News Corporation uh, private jet, even though he was no longer working um, in the Empire. Um, He was just a non-executive director. Lachlan took huge exception to that because it suggested that... Kind of largesse. 
yeah, large ass and entitlement on his and part. And it was wrong. By and it was wrong. Yeah. Uh, because it was actually James that had been using the private jet and Lachlan donated the proceeds. He sent a threatening letter. We made a correction and Lachlan donated the proceeds to charity. It wasn't about money. It was about the point that he was independent, genuinely independent while he was out here. That perception of independence was very important to him. Mm. And, you know, it's the same with the case against Crikey later. He was uh, not after money, although the, it's conceivable in a defamation case like that that they could have run into millions of dollars given the legal expenses. Yeah, it was a daunting prospect to do a biography of Lachlan. Particularly um, freelance. You're not, particularly you don't have a big media organisation behind you anymore. No. So, um, but I figured that in some ways other media competitors to news were not going to take on the sort of 800-pound gorilla in the industry. So someone had to do it, and so I thought that I should do it. Um, and I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well follow through. I've written all these books. I might as well get some letters after my name. And, um, and I spoke with uh, Macquarie University Professor of Media History, Bridget Griffin Foley, and she said, the history of Fairfax had been written by Gavin Souter. Um, the history of, she herself has written the history of Consolidated Press, the Packer Empire, but nobody has done a proper job on the history of News Corporation, the company. Again, there's been 50 books about Rupert, but there's more to the News Corporation story than Rupert. And so I'm actually trying to model it a little bit on, you know, the anarchy by um, William Dalrymple, the history of the East India Company. I think there's a rollicking tale there in this company, which is, you know, I mean, the buccaneers of the information economy. Uh, so the world's first global media empire. And I want to concentrate on it's a bit of it's kind of follow the money exercise. How how did they do it from this from this tiny little uh, company, News Limited, you know, based in Adelaide, all the way to, you know, the, the behemoth Fox and News Corporation uh, that we have today. And so really from having almost accidentally fallen into it because your publisher decided that he thought someone should do it and you should be the person, Murdoch's are going to be your your kind of world for the next few years by the sounds. Like the, now that you've taken the deep dive, this is your specialty. Do you like it? <laughs> well, I, I do because it's fascinating. I, I, the story just moves. There are new twists, new – so, yeah, I am going to be a paid-up Murdochologist. There's a few around the world. Rupert Murdoch, I suppose, has been the best story in media for more than 50 years. I do find it fascinating. I mean, I think what we're seeing in the appetite for succession and the, you know, we're just coming into the last final episodes. I think what we're seeing right now every week on our television screens is kind of one kind of version of how will this, how will this empire and this story end? You know, because because in some ways the most unlikely outcome is that there is an orderly succession from Rupert Murdoch to Lachlan and they consolidate the empire and travel on in the current direction um, that they're going and manage to survive. And a fourth generation enters the picture and, you know, in another hundred years we'll be talking about uh, still the Murdoch media. I think in some ways... That's the least likely outcome. What's what is quite possible, as the writers of the Succession have clearly or seem to have decided, is that it's quite possible that the whole thing could fall apart the moment uh, Rupert does die. The you know the divisions between the um, siblings could you know tear the company apart. Yeah, so you're a hostile here, you're predator actually- could tear the company apart. You're here at one of the most interesting inflection points. Actually, is what you're saying. Whereas if you'd been writing about them when Rupert was 60, less interesting than at this point when, as you say, when he does finally go, that's one of the most interesting times. Yes, yes, I think so. I mean, look, um, Elizabeth, Rupert's mother, Dame Elizabeth, lived to 103. Rupert, as we just saw through the depositions in the Dominion case, he's still sharp. He is intending, when he was engaged to Anne Leslie Smith, he said he was looking forward to spending the second half of his life with her. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, that was great, so actually. He's been joking about, you know, he's been tired of people speculating on his death for 30 years. Um, and he. Yeah, you, you might be retired by the time. <laughs> He might outlive this me. inflection point happens. <laughs> yeah, but but right now the story certainly is a fascinating story, and beyond that, it's an important public interest story, uh, because we are at a moment of 
kind of polarisation we are at a moment where democracy is under threat, particularly in the United States, in a way that certainly I'm more terrified than I was before I embarked on this project, that's for sure, about the future of American democracy. I mean, the guy who is potentially the Republican nominee, Donald Trump, you know, the potential for him to upend American democracy is uh, terrifying. Thanks, Paddy. That's all we've got time for. But um, enjoy the next few years of um, Murdoch watching and we'll enjoy reading what you write. Thanks, Katrina. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Julia Carr-Katzel. Technical assistance from Cormac Lally. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend. Good Weekend.